Chapter 29. Now the fatal blade was startin' to descend towards Sidney Carton, but he was taken heartin' knowing that the Darnie did get away. Darnie, he got away! I pulled the curtain closed as the last note of the final number faded, then opened it for the curtain call. I'd been too busy running around and carrying props to see much of the play, but I heard it all. When the audience clapped at the end, I pretended the applause was for me. We had five more performances scheduled between that weekend and next. Then it would be over. That was fine with me. Show business wasn't anywhere near as much fun as people thought. Julia was there, waiting for Kelly. I watched them walk off together. It was nice that the play hadn't ruined their friendship, though I was still sort of bummed that it hadn't started a new one between Julia and me. Wesley was there, too, sitting right up at the front, all the way to the left of the stage. When I thanked him for coming, he shrugged and said, No problem. It's way easier than the movies. To understand? He looked at me like I was an idiot. To sneak in. Over on the, far, on the right, far up the aisle, I saw Lee heading toward me. I'll catch you later, I said to Wesley. As he turned to leave, I headed over to cut Lee off. I had the feeling they shouldn't be allowed to get too close to each other. It would be like a snake and a mongoose. Great job, she said. You really managed to minimize the thumps and crashes. Of course. I'm a trained professional. She glanced past me toward the stage. I love that guillotine. Can I have it when you're done? It would look so great in my room. I'll ask Mr. Perchall. Tell him I have a ton of stuffed animals that need drastic body modification, and this would make the process so much easier. That's definitely a compelling argument. I checked with him right after Lee left, though I didn't pass along the details of her request. He said it was school property and he couldn't just give it away. Score one for the stuffed animals. As thrilling as it was to be part of the exciting world of the theater, I took greater pleasure in my journalistic efforts. I was sitting on my bed Tuesday evening, leafing through the school paper, when Bobby came in. He held up the play ticket. Hey, thanks for this. Did I miss it? Nah, it's on again this weekend. Any good? Not bad, for high school. He glanced down at the paper. You write another one? Yeah, I want it. I stopped before I could make a jerk out of myself by asking if he wanted to read it. Then I thought about sitting in the kitchen with Mom, reading to her from To Kill a Mockingbird. I picked up the paper. Want to hear it? That would be great. I read the article to him. I was a little nervous at first, but then I sort of enjoyed reading it out loud. It was nice hearing my words spoken, even if I was doing the one speaking. I caught a sentence or two that I wished I'd rewritten, but most of it sounded pretty decent. That's good, Scott. Really good. You have a gift. I shrugged. It's nothing. Don't ever say that. It's very good. Honest. Thanks. Bobby paused by the door on his way out. I haven't been much of a big brother. Are you kidding? You've been great. You take me places, you teach me all kinds of stuff about cars and music, and you've saved my butt lots of times. Remember when those big kids were chasing me? They were little, he said. Maybe to you. It was back when I was in first grade. Bobby had saved me from a group of third graders. When he was around, nobody ever picked on me. He smiled. Man, they sure took off when I showed up. The smile faded. Scott, what? You're not really creepy. I shouldn't have said that. I held up the paper. And you're not stupid. This isn't your fault. Somebody should have realized you needed help. Someone did. I wanted to say it was no big deal, but my throat had gotten kind of tight, so I just shrugged. As Bobby turned away, he said, I'm lucky you're my brother. He went back to his room before I could tell him I felt the same way. In a couple minutes, I heard an old song drift through the walls. He was playing While My Guitar Gently Weeps. April 30th. Don't get your hopes up, but I'm thinking that maybe it won't be all that unbearable having another brother. At least for the brief period you're around here before I find a buyer. I start my penultimate month of school tomorrow. I love that word. Here's something for you to think about. Penultimate means second from last. What do you think they call the thing that's third from last? 
Okay, Mr. Franca said, you cruised along for a month reading comics. Now it's time for some serious contemporary literature. I groaned along with everyone else, but I figured whatever he handed out would be interesting. We'd read some really difficult stuff scattered throughout the year, but none of it was boring. A minute later, I was staring down at a script on my desk. Not a play, either. This was a movie script for Terminator 2. <laughs> Welcome to Hollywood, Mr. Franca said. That weekend, we gave the last two performances of the play. When the crew was striking the set, in other words, when I was clearing the stage and the other guys were horsing around, I spotted Bobby standing in the back of the auditorium. I hopped off the stage and walked over to him. Not bad, he said. You like the play? Nah, but the stage crew rocked. Thanks. This whole school thing, you're doing good. Way better than I ever did. I think you can do whatever you want, anything at all. Except find the right wrench. Bobby shrugged. There are plenty of guys who can do that. I'm serious, except for that wrench thing. I bet you could do whatever you set your mind to. So can you, I said. No way. I'm just good at one thing. And right now, nobody's buying. There are a zillion guitar players out there. Hey, you want to ride home? No thanks. Believe it or not, I have a social event to attend. I finished up with the props and then went to the cast party. It was sort of like the dance. I stood around drinking soda, eating potato chips, and watching everyone else mingle. At least Julie and Vernon weren't there. You can do whatever you want. If only that were true. Kelly was there. What I wanted to do was walk over to her and ask her if she'd ever heard Julia mention me. But I didn't have the guts. I did overhear her say, they've been fighting a whole bunch. I couldn't tell who she meant, but I had my hopes. Mr. Perchall came over and clamped his hand on my shoulder. Well done. I hope we can count on your help next year, Scott. I mumbled something about needing to make sure it would fit in with my other activities. I had a feeling my career behind the curtains had gone as far as it was ever going to go. Between rehearsals and performances, I must have carried a grand total of about 87,000 tons of lumber. On the other hand, next year I could sit back, play poker, and let some poor freshman do all the work. The thought of that made me grin. Toward the end of the party, Ben came over, punched me on the shoulder, and said, Good job, Frosh. That was sort of nice. But after each of the other guys on the crew repeated the praise and punch routine, I was hurting. But it was a good sort of hurt. And then there are the bad hurts. They taught us on the newspaper that every story had to answer the questions who, what, when, where, why, and how. On Monday, coming out of the locker room after gym, which is the when and where, I had an unanticipated what with a totally unexpected who. Say what? Say this. I got in a fight with Kyle. I decided it was time to test Bobby's belief that I could do anything I wanted. This seemed like a good place to start. And I was willing to take the risk that Kyle would kid me about it. We'd just reached the door when I said to him, Hey, maybe you can get Kelly to mention me to Julia and see what she says about me. Forget it, Kyle said. She's out of your league. Ouch. Kyle was my friend. At least, he had been until he became a jock. Friends weren't supposed to be brutal about stuff like that. You're not exactly in Kelly's league, I said, or anyone else's. She probably wouldn't even look at you if you weren't a wrestler. He pushed my shoulder. Yeah, well, who's standing around ball by himself at the dances? Like you weren't? I pushed him back. Not anymore. He pushed me with both hands. I held off from pushing him back. I didn't want this to get out of control. I could get a date if I wanted. I lied. With who? Some freaky bitch with a face full of pins? The air in the hallway suddenly felt ten degrees warmer. Those words were way too familiar. What did you say? Kyle's eyes shifted away for an instant, then locked back on mine. Freaky bitch. You're the one who wrote on her locker. I expected him to deny it. Instead, he shrugged. Hey, it looks like you're not the only creative writer around here. And there went the why. I tackled him. No pushing, no working up to it. I just dove at him like a madman, which should have been a big mistake. Everyone knows it's a bad idea to tackle a wrestler, 
That's the first rule of fighting. If a guy knows how to fight on the ground, you have to stay away and use your fists. If he knows how to box, then you try to wrestle him. The second I grabbed Kyle, I realized I was in trouble. He'd just finished a whole season of wrestling. He'd have no trouble destroying me. A couple of seconds later, when I pinned him down, I was as surprised as anyone. So the how has to go unexplained. Kyle started swearing and saying he'd kill me. I let go, stood up, and stepped back, still not really believing I'd handled him so easily. That's when Mr. Cravuto broke things up. It figures. Gym teachers never stop a fight until they see it's pretty much over. Kyle glared at me when he walked off. I guess I'd known for a while that we weren't friends anymore, even though I didn't want to believe it. Until that moment, I'd still sort of hoped that things would go back to the way they'd been. But here's the reality of things. Kyle was once my second best friend. Bobby was once my flawless hero. Julia was once my kindergarten pal. And I was once my parents' youngest son. Unlike cars, lives don't have a way to go in reverse. May 9th. I got in a fight with Kyle. The weird thing is, he should have kicked my butt. I've been thinking about it for the last two days. The old me never would have beaten Kyle. But between gym class, stage crew, and calisthenics in Spanish, I guess I put on a bit of muscle. It's funny, in my mind I'm this skinny kid who usually doesn't lift anything heavier than a book. But my shirts are getting kind of tight across the chest, and my pants are short. Normally mom would have been on my case to get new clothes, but she's pretty distracted right now with this swelling sibling of mine, yeah, you, who's prevented her from seeing her feet for the last couple of months. I haven't gotten any clothes since Christmas. Now that I think of it, last week when we were doing fitness tests in gym, Mr. Cravuto actually said, nice hustle, Hudson, way to go. Once you get to know him, he's not such a bad guy. All the stuff I said before about getting out of gym, don't pay attention to that, okay? It's good to work out. You and I can lift weights together when you get older. Maybe you'll actually have the sort of big brother who can protect you. I think we'd both like that.